Greetings, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and joining. My name is Anthony Chuli, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at 250 OK. Joined by my two fabulous colleagues here, Luke Martinez, Solutions Architect, hey. and Sloan Simmons, Solutions Consultant. Hello. Um, and today, we are going to talk about email marketing best practices and how they apply to deliverability. Um, and this is, a, this is a topic that is very robust with lots of recommendations and tips. But my goal today is really talk about kind of the evolution of deliverability and how it's changed and some of the new trends that are emerging uh, and that marketers should be aware of and how to apply that to their marketing strategy and program to maximize email performance. Uh, so to start off with, I think it's really important to kind of take a look back and, and we talk about deliverability and it's, it's one of those notions that it's it's one of those things that's really hard to understand, right? It's got many different meanings to a lot of different people, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's all about maximizing email's ability to reach your subscribers in the inbox and in turn convert and generate revenue. Uh, and what's, what's unique about deliverability is it's one of those topics that sits in the middle of senders and receivers, and we have to be flexible and adapt how we consult and recommend best practices to our customers as the industry and, and both of those ends of the spectrum adapt and evolve. Uh, and so what I've noticed recently is some of the best practices that, that we've preached for years are changing and they're evolving. And it's really important for us to call those out and make, make our audience aware of those and our customers aware of those uh, because maybe it's something that they're not aware of or maybe they don't understand. Um, so let's dive in. And, and one of the ones that I think certainly is, is most relevant nowadays is we talk about reputation, sender reputation, and for a long time, that's it's really been tied to an IP address or IP addresses if you have more than one. Uh, but Luke, I wanted to start with you, and I wanted you to to kind of elaborate on what you've seen uh, with our customer base and in your experience around this this kind of newer concept about domain reputation and how that is connected to IP reputation, but a little bit different. Yeah, it, it's just as important as IP reputation is and was. Uh, IP reputation isn't going anywhere. It's still, you, you will still be judged based on the, the quality of the traffic that comes from the IPs that you send on. Yep. Uh, but what I, I hope that people can start to uh, get more comfortable with is that you're judged on your whole configuration. It's your authentication domains, it's your IP addresses you send from, it's the uh, content of your messages that you, that you can't pull one away from the other. Um, and to think about your reputation as my IP is good or my IP is bad, it's just, it's myopic and it's not, it's not enough. Like you are, you are, uh, you're more than just an IP address to, to modern spam filters. Um, and you know, the, the, you mentioned domain reputation. Uh, I always get this, I get a question pretty frequently is which domain are we talking about? Uh, like my domain, I have my from address that my, my clients see. I have my DKIM domain, which may or may not be exactly the same. Right. I might have a subdomain on it. And I have my SPF domain. It's, it's, it's all your domains. Like it, it's one configuration that they know you as. And you move one part, uh, you, should, you should do so with caution because they're, they get, they get used to seeing you a certain way from these IPs with these domains, um, and all the user engagement, recipient engagement that 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 they see or monitor on that configuration is your reputation. So yeah, we, so it's we, almost we, like an entity. It's yes. like it's not one or the other. It's it's more of a holistic aggregate right. scoring from mailbox providers. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Um, I think it's important to note as well that that domain reputation isn't something that every mailbox provider is leveraging, right? I think it's it's some of the more sophisticated and more tech heavy mailbox providers like the Gmails of the world and Yahoo's and Microsoft's. Um, so to your point, IP reputation isn't going anywhere, but I think that there's there's this growing trend of of domain as kind of that anchor, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's, that's tying a lot of those thousands of signals that mailbox providers look at when making filtering decisions or judgment on inbound mail. Yeah, so I, that, I, oh, go ahead. So that's one of the things that uh, is becoming more and more prevalent that has always existed, but you know, now is a full entity kind of situation is the concept of alignment. You know, when people are expecting, people being receivers expecting to see this set of IPs, this domain or subdomains have this uh, reporting associated with it, that's what they expect. So when you, you know, pop open a new brand and you start using that with your regular IPs or you just get another IP and you start sending the same domain across it, it'll have a reputational impact because 
you don't have the same alignment set up. So you have to start digging into the weeds to be able to figure out making sure everything is, is set in place so that you can maintain or build a new reputation around the same right. brand. And I, I think it's, uh, it, it feels more complicated because well, it used to just be IP and now I've yeah. got all this domain stuff and I don't authentication, blah, blah, blah. The same rules apply. Like it's not that much, it's not any different really than building yeah. your IP reputation. Good things are opens and clicks and replies and forwards and bad things are spam reports and non-engagement. So you manage your domain reputation the exact same way you manage your your IP reputation. Um, even down to, I think you mentioned spinning up a new brand or a new domain, uh, you want to do do some kind of warm up. Um, what, what the ideal warm up is kind of depends on a lot of things, whether you're switching IPs as well as domains and uh, outside the scope of, of this best conversation. There's practices, but it's customizable. Yeah, absolutely. But you do want to, you make a change to your domain, you want to you wanna introduce that to the world sort of slowly uh, and monitor, you know, monitor open rates, monitor bounces and, and blocks and all that stuff that you would do with a new IP. Yeah, and make sure you're prepared, like have all of your authentication in place, have yep. all of your mail streams ready to go, as opposed to just, well, we're just gonna try this, you know, work in segmentation and get that ready. Before we move on to the next topic, I think one of the things that I've personally kind of evolved in my recommendations is as, as domain reputation has become more prominent and adopted, I used to only recommend separating out mail streams like transactional marketing with an IP address. Uh, now my recommendation is to do it both from a domain and an IP perspective because of the relevance of domain reputation. And you certainly don't want those to be influenced by two totally different streams of mail. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, it's it's a good idea. I uh, I think even Google or Gmail has it documented somewhere in their best practices. It's like use segment your mail streams using an IP and a domain, especially when you're talking about uh, transactional versus marketing. Uh, I don't think every marketing stream necessarily needs its own subdomain. Uh, you know, daily newsletter dot brand dot com and weekly newsletter dot brand dot com. Like you, you can go, you can go too far, right. but you certainly want a different subdomain. Uh, in a, on occasion, maybe even a, a different root domain for your transactional and your, and your marketing, marketing email. Um, I wanted to talk about what I call the top of funnel, right? So th that to me means the point of data acquisition, data sources, the opt-in importance, and kind of that initial onboarding experience from a subscriber. And what I found in my experience is, I, I would argue 90% of the problems, deliverability problems that customers have tie back to data quality yeah. at, at some varying degree. Um, and as, as easy of a notion as it is to say, you have to get opt-in, you have to have explicit opt-in, it's still one of those challenging areas that really end up downstream impacting a lot of different things. Um, so for me, the, the opt-in process is as standard as it should be, explicit opt-in, no pre-check boxes, setting expectations, a clear and prominent way to, to identify, this is what you're signing up for, this is why we're asking for your email address. Yeah, that, the, the expectation setting is huge, and I, I feel like that's where a lot of people kind of, they miss. So even if they're doing an, an explicit opt-in, I always use the words explicit and informed right. consent. Uh, just checking, a, even if they take the, the, the explicit action to check a box and say, I want your stuff, what is your stuff? Um, you need to outline that very clearly at the point of, at the point of address collection, uh, if you can. And if you can't, you need to outline it right away in your first welcome right. message saying like, thanks for signing up, here's what to expect. Right. And if they don't like what they're going to get, they can opt out very you know, fail clearly fast, and easily. Right? Yeah, this fail is, fast. It's the whole point of just being upfront and honest. So you don't want to obfuscate in any way that you are signing up for this progress, for, for this process. My most received response to explicit opt-in is well, my business doesn't allow for that. The answer is you can always work some kind of explicit opt-in or welcome series in to be able to funnel down for engagement. And I like to I like to think like humanize that that experience. So what I always tend to do is a lot of these things are somewhat technical or complex to understand and I always try to just boil it down to you know kind of the grandma test, right? If you guys have heard about that like can my grandma do this or will she understand this? And so the, the kind of shifting into the, the latter part of this topic about the onboarding and welcome experience, 
it's more or less if, if you walk into a room and meet someone, you want to have that handshake, that introduction to understand who they are, uh, and that, that, that dynamic of meeting someone new. And I think essentially that's what a welcome email or welcome journey and onboarding process is. It's your first impression. It's, it, it means so much when you sign up for an email program, that first experience or first few onboarding emails. Um, and oftentimes those have some of the highest engagement rates yeah. of any mail. So it's, it's a crucial period for a brand to really start off on the right foot, make a good impression, and really set the course and the foundation for uh, their relationship with that scriber so moving on. We were just talking about this recently, and I think you had the perfect example of meeting somebody in a group setting for the first time and saying, you know, hello, doing name introductions, and then never talking to each other again for three months. And then three months later, we meet each other, and I just come right up to you and start talking and talking right. and talking, and you're standing there. I have no idea who right. you are. I'm so sorry. The converse is also true where, you know, if you meet somebody for the first time and you just blast them with conversation, there's a chance that there's going to be a little bit of defensiveness. So being able to create a routine relationship with, uh, with subscribers because it is a person on the other end as opposed to just a data point and a yeah. dollar. I think w one other thing on, uh, on, opt-in or consent um, is that it, it is temporary. And I think that some people assume, uh, you know, that I, lined, I outlined what they were going to get. They checked the box. They gave me their address. That's great. That's like table stakes. You should be doing that for, uh, for all the addresses you collect. But that kind of, that consent is temporary. And I like to think of an email engagement, like opens or clicks. Um, is is sort of reaffirming that consent and if that disappears for six months nine months a year different for every brand and kind of mailing cadence but uh regardless of what you do up front to collect an address and give them informed explicit consent uh it is temporary and you've got to at some point take the hint if if you know a properly collected address stops engaging take the hint so that's the perfect perfect phrasing for both uh, people who opt in and people who opt out is it is potentially temporary. Yeah. Somebody that hits the unsubscribe yeah. button, you could have caught them on a bad day. You could have just sent them the wrong thing at the wrong time. Uh, it could be that they really didn't sign up for you. Maybe they were part of an append, but they didn't recognize you and happened to go check out your site and then decided that they do want to sign up. So unsubscribing and opting out shouldn't be looked at as something that is an end all be Negative. all. Oh, right. No, you know, it's always going to be better to have somebody given the option to very clearly given the option to unsubscribe versus true. I can't find this. So I'm just going to hit I the always spam say button. Uh, an unsubscribe is the spam report that didn't happen. Yes. And spam and reports are bad. <laughs> Unsubscribes aren't great. You don't want to, you know, lose right. half your list. No one wants to lose their list. If they're not marking a message as spam, that's a it's win. It's the healthy alternative. <laughs> to adjust your preferences yep. and opt out. Um, two other things that I want to get through here uh, before we wrap is, is one, is this notion about what I call subscriber activity or defining active targeting. And I think marketers in general just always have a hard time, whether it's cutting your list, which no one wants to do, uh, but also saying I've got a database of 10 million subscribers, but only 5 million of those have opened an email in X amount of time, whether it be three months or six months. And, uh, we're starting to see, we talk about the evolution of deliverability, we're starting to see mailbox providers using AI and new features to, to actually prompt subscribers that haven't opened up an email in as little as 30 days, saying, hey, do you want to unsubscribe from this? Like, are you still interested in receiving this email? And that's 30 days, right? And I feel like a lot of marketers have zero to 12 month defined active targeting where even if you haven't opened up an email in 11 months, you're still getting the routine emails. Um, so for me, it's, Active targeting is going to be different for everybody. It really depends on your business, your industry, uh, your cadence and frequency. But this notion of engagement that's been talked about a lot is it's really important. And it's, it's, it, it's clearly important to mailbox providers as they're baking that into uh, things like nudging and um, um, you know, notifications of like helping you manage your inbox. Um, I've, I've always 
and this is this is pretty recent, I guess, in the last few years. But I, f I think that time since last engaged uh, is a is a phrase that I use a lot, and I think everyone should know how long has it been since this address engaged an email. You should know that the same way you know whether they're male or female, right? Uh, whether they've bought something or they haven't bought something. Like that needs to be a known quantity for every address on your list, and then you need to to act on that. You know, you need to treat your six month non engagers a little differently than your three month or your 30 day even. I mean, if you're sending seven messages a week, uh, 30 days without engagement is a lot of messages. And that data is in the UI as well, right? We right. have that data. So that's one of, one of my favorite parts about being able to run around the 250 OK tool is combining the different efforts of what each program will allow you to segment your list by. So being able to look through those demographics and create a specifically targeted engagement based list for even for remediation, you know, where where reputation in, is uh, is key for some of this machine filtering, being able to create a targeted segment for rebuilding that reputation, or even just testing new flows out. Like if you want to run through and say, okay, I want people that have opened an email within the last. 10 days that meet all of these other criteria that I have set in and I'm going to try this new segment out and see how it does. It, it gives you that ability to start monitoring, one, how it does against right. everything else that you're sending. Visibility is key. But also to create that list in the first place. Right. So work smarter. Well, thanks, guys. Um, I wanted to wrap, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hopefully, these best practices will help you optimize and maximize your email performance. And thank you so much, guys, for, for your time. It was great. Sure. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.